The prophet Zechariah may be the most underestimated prophet in the Bible. And here to talk with us today about Zechariah and his prophecy is uh, Dr. David Schnitger. Uh, David, welcome to Prophecy Watchers. It's great to be with you, Gary. Holding your book here, Zechariah, Israel, and Her Coming King. Somebody needed to write this book because Zechariah is loaded with prophecies of all sorts. What would you say is the most important thing about uh, the prophecy of Zechariah? Well, uh, of the minor prophets, there are more messianic prophecies in, uh, the, in the book of Zechariah than any of the other minor prophets. And it comes in a close second to Isaiah, which of course has 66 chapters. Mm -hmm. So for a small book, it's like a, a gold mine that's full of nuggets. Uh, but it's small enough to where if you blink you might miss it. Right. It's kind of condensed. It is. It really is. Now, when you talk about something being condensed, uh, usually you're talking about taking a big subject and putting it down into very few words, which is exactly what he does. Mm -hmm. There's 14 chapters, and uh, of course, like other uh, prophetic books in the uh, in the Bible, Old or New Testament, uh, it's not necessarily in chronological order. So it does require some discernment uh, in terms of uh, interpretation. Uh, but the fact that there are so many uh, uh, prophecies concerning both the first and second advents of Christ uh, I think makes it very important. And again I use the illustration of a gold mine um, you know, and not that I'm a gold miner, but you know you just as you go through Zechariah you're just kind of minding your own business and reading the, the different uh, visions for example in the first six chapters and you see these little symbols you know, like the uh, the two witnesses in one of the night visions, and you think, now what does that have to do with anything? Or the candlesticks? Now, one thing you talk about uh, is your belief that Zechariah should not be taught as an allegory. Yes, it is actually uh, as believable as today's news. In other words, it should be, it should be literally interpreted. Right. Although the language is, is sometimes strange. For example, you have the horses among the myrtle trees and the four horns and the four carpenters, and your first tendency is to think, wow, that's, I can't understand that. That's, that's too far out. <laughs> yes. But this is where you come in, uh, to uh, the aid of the reader, because mm -hmm. I think you've done a marvelous job of interpreting these mm -hmm. symbols. Mm -hmm. I think there's a tendency, Gary, for, for preachers and even you know, lay people as they study the Word to get to certain portions uh, like the Levitical genealogies, and you just kind of give up yeah. and say, well, it may be inspired, but it's irrelevant. And then when you get, for example, to these uh, eight, nine night visions in, Gen in Zechariah 1 to 6, it, it becomes so dense with symbols, you know, candlesticks, mm -hmm. myrtle trees, ephahs, that the tendency is just, just to think, well, whatever it meant to Zechariah, it doesn't mean anything to me. Mm -hmm. So let me just fast forward and get to the good stuff. And what I've done in Zechariah is slow down and, and actually have a couple of chapters devoted to those night visions in chapters 1 through 6 mm -hmm. uh, because I think those are foundational in helping us to understand what follows. Now I'd like to just uh, illustrate what you were saying. Chapter 12, I'm going to skip to the end of Zechariah. Chapter uh -huh. 12 uh, talks about the burden of the word of the Lord. And verse 2 says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in siege uh, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. Now, probably everybody knows this verse, the verse that I just read. Mm -hmm because it seems so applicable to what's happening in Israel today. And so you'll go bang right for that verse and say, okay, now I understand Zechariah. Mm -hmm. Except, whoops, <laughs> you've left out the first 11 chapters. Mm -hmm. right. uh, there is a build-up uh, to the 12th chapter. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and this is what I find very important. In other words, a total understanding of what Zechariah is doing here. And it's literal. It is not 
figurative language, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. even though it sounds like it mm -hmm. from time to time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I agree. The, uh, you have to take the book as a whole. It's all Holy Spirit inspired, every word of it. And without getting too deep into the, the night visions, uh, uh, some of them deal with judgment. And uh, in general, uh, they deal with judgment against nations or empires that come against Israel. And you have to, you know, again, you know, uh, put on, uh, uh, do a little a background in terms of, now is this referring to some historical judgments such as mm -hmm. what took place in uh, Babylon or Medo-Persia, uh, etc.? Uh, or is it something that's yet unfulfilled? And we won't uh, make all of those determinations here, but I think to understand from those first six chapters that God deals harshly and in judgment with nations and empires that come against His anointed nation. And so if you understand that as a background, when you get to Zechariah chapter 12, though we might be able to have some interesting discussions about the timing, mm -hmm. when yeah. will this happen? Uh, we should not have any uh, question as to the fact that it will happen. Indeed. In other words, that there will be judgment against uh, uh, nations that come against Jerusalem. And the fact of the matter is that in the end times, Zechariah as well as other prophetic books predict that Jerusalem will be this, a cup of trembling. That it will be the source of consternation, hatred, antagonism, by, as Zechariah 12 too says, all the people round about. So there is a, a picture of increasing uh, antagonism toward Israel in right. Jerusalem uh, as the last days progress. And we see that today. Hamas and Hezbollah and all the various parties that are gathering around Jerusalem. So uh, I think that's why people would focus on the, the latter portion of, of the prophecy. But going back to the beginning of it, uh, I, I have my uh, a copy of your book open to page three here where you talk about the historical background of Zechariah and uh, about what uh, Ezra says about uh, the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Mm -hmm. And the way you open your book you set Zechariah historically in place. Uh, and I think that's a really good way to start the book. Like many uh, uh, Old Testament books and New Testament as well, as you know Gary, there's an immediate context, right. a near-term need, uh, and then there's a long-term prospect. So the near-term uh, need, Gary, uh, as the uh, 50,000 Judahites who were returning to Judah, uh, Zechariah was trying to encourage them to finish that second temple. And so the, the near-term purpose of the book was to encourage God's people to uh, rebuild the temple, finish the temple, resume temple worship, but he also utilized a more long-term or big-picture view to encourage them as well. That there is a, a great destiny for the nation of Israel. Uh, they should not be discouraged because the, the temple that they were building did not resemble the, the glory of the first temple. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was a, a long-term vision. And uh, so Zechariah um, uh, is addressing near-term issues to encourage God's people but at the same time utilizing the big picture, so to speak, in terms of Israel's great destiny. By the way, that was a daunting task to rebuild mm -hmm. that temple mm -hmm. because it was a wreck and a, and a huge uh, project mm -hmm. right. for a very few people who didn't have much in the way of tools and money and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this becomes a message. <clears throat> and chapter 2 it's what you were mentioning a minute ago where he goes into the, to the fact that uh, this temple is not going to be nearly as beautiful as the first temple. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, mm -hmm. build it and, and I'll bless it. So that's kind of the way this book starts out. But with an, as you say, with an eye toward the future because one of these days on that platform that exists in Jerusalem another temple will be built. With a Messiah uh, to of course build it and to occupy it as well. Yeah. So they were in a, a, a very low uh, point in their history. They had been decimated by the Babylonian captivity. Only 50,000 uh, were able to return. Uh, the poorest of uh, those from Judah were not taken into captivity, but they were not of, of great uh, help in this project. Uh -huh. And of course none of the surrounding nations were of any encouragement too. Uh, and as we learned from Nehemiah, the walls were destroyed too. 
uh, the city was decimated. And um, they had begun the temple rebuilding project and for one reason or another they had stopped. And so Zechariah's message was, first of all, a message of repentance. Return to me and I will return to you. Zechariah chapter 1. And then as evidence of their repentance he said, okay, now it's time to pick up the trowel, you know, and uh, uh, resume the rebuilding uh, to resume holy worship of God. But again, uh, he doesn't limit it to the immediate, but uh, uh, gives a message of hope and really uh, a message of um, God's uh, ultimate victory over the forces of evil in the person of the Messiah. Now, as you move on in this book, there are some very important uh, symbols. <clears throat> there are the, the symbols of, that are involved with the olive trees and the uh, seven-branched menorah with, with those olive trees to the right and to the left. By the way, the, the seal of national Israel today, if you ever look at their official documents, contains this very picture, a menorah with an olive tree on each side. So the, the seal of modern Israel is, is that symbol. Do you think it came from Zechariah 4? I think they must have read the Bible. I think so. <laughs> I think so. So <clears throat> that would seem to be uh, uh, where they got it. And then we have the flying scroll, the mysterious flying scroll. Mm -hmm. uh, what is, what's that? And the woman in the ephah, you were talking a minute ago about uh, some symbols that seem so bizarre that, that you really can't make head or tail out of them. However, in your book I think you've done a marvelous job of explaining those symbols. I believe that the flying roll or flying ephah of uh, chapter 5 is in general a description of coming judgment and um, uh, against the, uh, the world because of, uh, of uh, wickedness. And uh, I think one of the, the major themes of the uh, night visions of the first six chapters uh, have to do with the, uh, the judgment that will come to nations that come against Israel. Um, uh, and I think in the context of uh, these first six chapters it would have to do with uh, uh, historical nations, the judgment that had just befallen Babylon because of their uh, uh, treatment of Israel, uh, and then uh, future empires such as Medo-Persia, etc. So uh, these, um, these night visions are meant, I believe, to encourage um, the folks in Judah and uh, in terms of God's protection of them, and also as a warning to the nations that would uh, besiege uh, Israel in terms of the, the judgment that would be waiting for them. So the scroll is sort of a picture of the law. <clears throat> yes. Flying all over the whole earth. And mm -hmm. the, the whole earth is being judged by the law. Right. Uh, the, the woman in the ephah, uh, it would, and you point this out in your book, and we don't have a lot of time to go into uh, the details. That's why you should, by the way, read the book. But uh, the woman in the ephah is a perfect picture of Mystery Babylon, mm -hmm. the great mm -hmm. mother of harlots. Mm -hmm. It this really is looking is. a long way into the future. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it seems to me, you know, to put on your detective hat for a minute, Gary, it, it's like you're doing an investigation. And what you see scattered through the book of Zechariah are little uh, clues. And they're not necessarily developed, uh, you know, as we see in uh, uh, Zechariah 5 and verse 7. It talks about a woman that sits in the midst of the ephah uh, that is described as wickedness. Well, where is that developed uh, more fully? Well, you have to move into Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots. So, you know, it is as if God in the book of Zechariah is giving us clues to the future. Like in a well-developed plot, you'll have a, a symbol or an object that is planted. You don't know the initial uh, 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 importance of those, mm -hmm. but as the plot continues you see those same symbols picked up on and developed. So in the progressive uh, revelation of Scripture, and I use progressive there in a good way, uh, I believe that the, the Bible progressively reveals the mind of God. And so we have some things that are just dropped into the book that aren't necessarily developed in full, but are important because they will come back later on. Sort of like uh, reading Daniel and then comparing that to Revelation. Right. A lot of what's in Daniel is well developed in Revelation. Mm -hmm. and the same is true of Zechariah. Mm -hmm. 
And for example, in one of the uh, night visions, it talks about two witnesses. Yeah. It doesn't really develop it in right. terms of who or where or when. But of course, when we go to Revelation chapter 11, there's two witnesses again. Right. And so uh, the New Testament picks up where the Old Testament leaves off to develop the full picture of uh, what God is up to in the future. When I read Zechariah, you know, it may seem like, ooh, that's a little difficult to understand. But then after it begins to open up, it is encouraging because mm -hmm. you can see what God is, is planning on doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, I'm looking very much forward to. <laughs> right. And, you know, uh, I think Zechariah illustrates so well that when you uh, have an understanding of Bible prophecy, maybe you don't have all the details and the when and the where and etc. But if you, if you get the big picture, which is that those who know Christ, those who are redeemed, are on the winning side of history. Yeah. And it gives you a totally different framework from that which you get from the nightly news, for example. Right. When If that's your total focus, you'll think, well, the, the cause of Christ is a losing cause. We're on the losing side of well, history. Well said. And I mean, when I watch uh, the quote-unquote nightly news, and there are several uh, organizations uh, you do tend to begin to think after a while, wow, I'm not on the winning side at all. Mm -hmm. The Christians are all going away and we're becoming weaker and weaker. Right. Right. A and yet the Bible doesn't say that at all. Zechariah says exactly the opposite. Right. The devil and uh, those who follow him, they have an eschatology. They do. They, they yeah. do have a view of the future and of humanity and it's totally opposite of God's view. So really when you get into Bible prophecy it reorients your thinking toward the truth. It kind of helps uh, 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 unbrainwash you because we are being brainwashed. Absolutely. You know. We have multiple uh, news channels but they all have the same message and that is that God is irrelevant and Christians are just old fashioned fuddy duddies and that the real action is going on you know, uh, among the elites as they build their new world order. Their uh, um, humanistic millennium. And so that's, that's the agenda that is forced upon us on a continual basis. Now how do we counteract that? Well, it's not through positive thinking. <laughs> no, not at all. It, it's through <clears throat> the Word of God. And the Word of God is very contrarian and so you have to have a certain tenacity about it and you have to be willing to be contrarian and swim upstream and to basically tune out uh, the the uh, humanist vision of the future. But what Zechariah does, in, in not in a complete sense because it's just one of 66 books, but it gives us in, in a kind of a kernel form uh, a panorama of the future uh, and it's centered in Israel, it's centered in Jerusalem and it's centered in the prospect of the, the coming uh, Christ. We have here in chapter 6 the crowning of Joshua. <clears throat> now the crowning of Joshua is, this is at a time when the Israelites, the, the tribes of Israel would have, would have thought of themselves as the ultimate losers. They're coming back to a, 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 a land that has been absolutely ripped apart, to, to a temple that's been ripped apart. And God is essentially saying, okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, keep it going. And the crowning of Joshua, t let's talk about that a bit. Of course we know that Joshua is the Hebrew name for Jesus. Yes. So the symbolism is not hard for us to, to uh, begin to, uh, uh, to understand. And uh, with the um, uh, crowning of Joshua, again, I, I think it gives to us a uh, foretaste of the coming of Christ uh, uh, Je Jehovah our salvation uh, and we also have a messianic um, uh, term of Christ given in verse 12 of chapter 6 uh, the man whose name is the branch and he shall grow up out of his place and shall build the temple of the Lord. So the crowning of Joshua I think is, is a foretaste of um, the crowning of Christ yes. who is the, the uh, high priest of God uh, and um, also who will be um, the king over all the earth. So the dual role of Christ I think is foreshadowed in the, the crowning of Joshua in chapter 6. Moving ahead, and we're running out of time here, uh, the future of Israel. Uh, we see if you moved ahead, move ahead to chapter 9, the whole thing is written about the nations that will surround Israel. <clears throat> 
And it's called The Burden of the Word of the Lord in the Land of Hadrach, and Damascus shall be the rest thereof, when the eyes of the man, as all the tribes of Israel, shall be toward the Lord. So this is looking into uh, the far future. Mm -hmm. and, and again, it's the view of Zechariah is, is someone who's trying to give some in, encouragement to people who don't have much reason for encouragement. This probably would include us today because you look at the world and you, you see the, all of the, the evil forces taking command mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you go back to Joshua and you can see that that's not going to last for long. Mm -hmm. the, the good guys are going to win. One thing that just occurred to me, maybe isn't where you were directing your thinking, but you know, sometimes when things are right in front of our face, we don't see them. But in Zechariah, there's the assumption that Israel is going to be restored to the land. This book would make no sense if it wasn't for the fact that Israel is restored to the land and that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, which is a very controversial issue and today, isn't it? By the way, that's timely. It's very timely. The capital city mm -hmm. of Israel is Jerusalem, is Jerusalem. except Nobody wants to say that. Right. <laughs> and that's assumed. If, if you were on a desert island, Gary, and had not had the benefit of reading theologies, etc., and you were just reading Zechariah for the first time, your assumption would be that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Because it's mentioned so many times. It is the center of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And when the nations come against um, Israel, chapter 12, Chapter 14, what does it say? They come against Jerusalem, the capital of Israel. Yes. So uh, the, those who advocate a replacement theology, that there is no end time Israel, uh, and that the church has replaced uh, uh, Israel, will have a hard time with Zechariah, unless they get very fanciful and allegorical. Because this talks about a nation, Israel back in the land, Jerusalem is the capital, and the events really... Uh, center around Jerusalem. Now this brings us to the final three chapters in Zechariah and again we've had to race through this. I, wa I want to emphasize uh, that David's book once again is called <clears throat> Zechariah, Israel and Her Coming King. And uh, it's just a terrific study aid. I mean as I, I've read a lot of books, uh, commentaries, uh, study guides. This one is very well laid out. And it opens up Zechariah in a way that uh, I don't think there's another book out there that's quite like it. Mm -hmm. So you are to be congratulated well, on that. I intended it to, to provoke further study. Yeah. You know, there are some, Absolutely. some uh, books, well-written commentaries, and you read through them and you think, well, I guess I've learned everything there is to know. Right. Well, that was not my intention. My intention was to kind of uh, provide an impetus for further study and to say, you know, there are some gold nuggets in this book that need to be right. uncovered, and I've just uncovered a few of them. Well, Zechariah 12 talks about uh, the capital of Israel, Jerusalem. It talks about a war that's involved with that, uh, involving that capital. Mm -hmm. and the contest uh, uh, to see whether Jerusalem is actually the capital or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And guess who wins the war? Mm -hmm. Israel does. <laughs> Israel does. Right, right. And it's right here in black and white. Mm -hmm. And not only that, after the war, Judah, the tribe of Judah, it, which represents you know Israel, is born again, if you mm -hmm. will. Mm -hmm. uh, Right. I will pour out upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplications. That is definitely the salvation of, mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, right. of Israel. It's the day of national restoration. Yeah. And then you have <coughs> the prior events that lead up to the founding of the, uh, the kingdom, the building of the second temple and so forth. Mm -hmm. So again, this is metaphoric language, but the story is, is the story that we all think of. Mm -hmm. Israel mm -hmm. coming back to life in the latter days. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's very encouraging mm -hmm. to read it that way. Let me just tell you, before we're out of time completely, <coughs> uh, we have uh, David's book with an accompanying DVD. Tell me about the DVD. Well in the DVD, it's a 20 minute DVD, Gary, mm -hmm. and what I attempt to do in a very ambitious way is deal with every messianic prophecy in the book of Zechariah first coming and second coming, with explanation, and uh, th some really nice PowerPoint slides and some music, and if people can put up with the narrator, it's actually a pretty good presentation. <laughs> We're calling this the Messianic Prophecy Package. The book, the DVD for your gift of $25, free shipping anywhere in the U.S., 
They make a terrific package to make it all very uh, pleasant experience. Uh, PowerPoint will give you the cross-sectional idea of the book, and then you can go into detail in the book. Book and the DVD, the Messianic Prophecy Package, your gift of $25. Free shipping anywhere in the United States. We have a, a larger package. We love to put things together in packages here at Prophecy Watchers, and uh, we have what we're calling the Blessed Hope conference package, including uh, this stack of DVDs. So we're talking about 70 messages from the Blessed Hope Prophecy uh, Conference that uh, we recently held uh, back in October. By the way, uh, just to read off a few names of the speakers you'll find here, not only will, will you find our, our good friend David Schnitger, but you'll find uh, other people that uh, I'm sure you've heard of. Jonathan Kahn would be one of them, Bill Koenig, uh, we have uh, Brent Miller Jr., David Hocking, Jack Langford, uh, Jeff Kinley. I'm on the presentation list. Uh, we have lots and lots of guys. Thomas Ice, head of the Pre-Trib uh, Study Center in Dallas, Texas. Lots of people that, that uh, you've heard of before and whom you have, uh, have grown familiar with over uh, time. So we have the conference package with the DVD set. Uh, David's book comes absolutely free with that, and the DVD comes absolutely free with that for your gift of $135 free shipping and handling anywhere in the U.S. of A. And you're going to have, well, what can I say, a very co cross-sectional, comprehensive uh, method of studying Bible prophecy. I want you to focus, though, for a minute on David's book because... I want to get back to something we said early on, and that is Zechariah is kind of a key. That is to say, he unlocks other prophecies. So if you're familiar with Zechariah, you can go almost anywhere, right? Right, absolutely. You can go into the Gospels and find the expansion on the first coming of Christ, which uh, Zechariah deals with. Then you can go to the book of Revelation, and that will open up your understanding of Zechariah as well. So it is like a key. It's an entrance to a fuller understanding of the New Testament. And a very encouraging key. I can't tell you how many times I have read Zechariah 12 too, Behold, I'll make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. Thinking of what's going on today, right now. And I'm thinking, oh, I've read the rest of the book. I know what's going to happen. <laughs> so mm -hmm. It's very timely. Very timely indeed. Uh, I think you're going to love David's book. And I uh, just want to say thanks to you for coming by, sharing uh, a, a few insights with us. David Schnitger, uh, you uh, uh, of course have your own uh, broadcast. I should mention that before we leave. Yes, Southwest Prophecy Ministries right here in Oklahoma City. We produce a weekly podcast and articles. Uh, folks can find us at swpm.us. Okay, very good. Glad you got that in. I'm Gary Stearman. Hey, you keep watching. We are... Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com where you can sign up for our free email newsletter or follow us at facebook.com slash prophecywatchers. In the meantime, keep watching everybody and we'll see you soon.